The meditation is very simple, and it's one that anyone can perform. What you would want to do is set a timer for about 13 minutes. I don't think it has to be exactly 13 minutes, but since that's what they included in the study, you would set a timer for 13 minutes, you would sit or lie down, close your eyes, and you would simply focus on your breathing. Most people are going to benefit from only doing that breathing through their nose, but if you have some sort of obstruction or inability to breathe just through your nose, you could probably also do it by breathing through your nose and mouth or just your mouth. But ideally, you would do just nasal breathing for a period of 13 minutes, concentrating on that breathing and concentrating, meaning bringing your awareness, your so-called interoceptive awareness, if you wanted to get really uh, technical about it, your interoceptive awareness to a point just about an inch inside of your forehead. Now, of course, that might sound kind of gory to some of you who've never actually been inside your forehead, but just about an inch behind your forehead is where you would want to place your concentration while also concentrating on your breathing. Need motivation? Watch it up then with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because in my first business, I quit on my business partner. I was making 300 bucks a month and I didn't have the motivation to keep going. And the thing that got me through was studying the stories of entrepreneurs who've had massive success. And I hope that in sharing these stories with you, you find a motivation to keep going. And if I'm being honest, I still need the stories for myself today too. So today let's learn from one of the best, Andrew Huberman and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Here's the thing about meditation that all studies of meditation show, which is that unless you are a very experienced meditator, your concentration, your focus will drift away from your breathing and away from that location about an inch inside your head, inside your brain, about just behind your forehead. That will happen maybe every 10 seconds, every 20 seconds, maybe even every five seconds. But an important part of such a meditation practice to improve concentration and focus is that you are continually refocusing back to that specific location and refocusing back on your breath. This is something that, again, is not often discussed. People think that if you do a meditation and you're supposed to concentrate on your breath, that if your mind drifts, that somehow you failed in that meditation. But actually, that's not the case. A huge component of improving your ability to focus and concentrate by way of neural plasticity, rewiring of the circuits for focus and concentration is the repeated return to a state of focus from a state of non-focus or diminished focus. Okay, so think about it like trying to drive down the freeway and staying between the lane lines, excuse me, and every once in a while, because there's a bit of drift on the vehicle, maybe the wheels aren't aligned correctly or there's something else wrong with the chassis or the steering device, it starts to drift right a little bit, then you hit the rumble strip to go, and then you pull back to the center. That's really what a focused meditation practice is about, as opposed to expecting yourself to stay between the mental lane lines, so to speak. So if you're somebody who's going to do a practice of the sort that I described, you know, 13 minute meditation practice every day, you'd want to sit or lie down, close your eyes, start to concentrate on your breath, focus your attention on a location about an inch behind your forehead, and then fully expect that at some point you'll be thinking about something else and that's a cue to focus back to that location just about an inch behind your forehead and back to your breath. By doing that repeatedly over and over, what you're really training up is the network within your brain that indeed includes that prefrontal cortex that you're focusing on, as well as some other structures, the infratemporal cortex, indeed the hippocampus, a structure associated with memory, and other components of the neural circuit that are involved in directing our mental focus and concentration. Again, I can't emphasize the importance of this practice being one of focusing and refocusing. In fact, I would prefer to call such a practice a refocus focus meditation or a constantly refocusing, or maybe you all can come up with a better name for it. I'm certainly not that good at naming things. But this sort of meditation practice has been shown in the study by the Suzuki Lab and other studies to really improve people's ability to focus and remain focused. So much so that in the beautiful book, Altered States, they describe a number of different meditation practices, some a little bit longer than the one that I described, one that's 17 minutes, another one that's 30 minutes. Some people will meditate as long as 60 minutes a day, although that's quite a long time in my opinion. The point here isn't how long you focus or somehow trying to achieve total focus for the entire 13 minute or 17 minute or 60 minute bout of meditation. While that would be wonderful, and I think many people aspire to do that, that's a lot of hard mental work. I think for most people out there, including myself, a relatively short meditation practice of about 13 minutes in which you fully expect 
your focus and concentration to drift, but that you are continually refocusing is going to be the most effective. Yes, indeed, the most effective at teaching yourself to focus and stay concentrated. In fact, I invite you to interpret every time that you focus off that location about one inch behind your forehead as an opportunity to refocus and think about the refocusing as the trigger for teaching your neural circuits how to focus for extended periods of time. Rule number two, aim for lifelong learning. On a trial by trial basis, we know that when you fail at an attempt, on the next attempt, your forebrain is in a position to, to engage better. And this makes total sense, right? You feel that frustration, uh, and you want to get the next one right? Well, you're harboring, or I should say funneling more neural resources. Your focus, that aperture, tightens. Now you have to be mindful of that too because when you have a failure and then you're like, you're gonna hit the bulls. I'm thinking about a dartboard because I'm terrible at darts. You know, sober I'm terrible at darts. I don't even drink. So that next trial, part of the problem is is that focus can narrow so much that you can start to lose access to information that might help you if you were just to relax a little bit and dilate that focus a little bit. But in general, on a trial by trial basis, focus is the cue that your nervous system is going to be positioned to learn better on the next trial. Now, in terms of life experiences, gosh, I wish for everyone fewer failures and more successes, but you know, failures keep you humble. And I've had a lot of them. I mean, if people ever wanted and they, you know, I'd be happy to tell you about it. I mean, I've made a ton of mistakes in life, a ton of mistakes. Some of those were mistakes of persistence like dumb decisions, I kept, like it's gonna change, it's gonna change, and it's clearly never gonna change. And then some were failures of misjudgment about other people or situations, and a lot of them were just plain failures, like the experiment didn't work, or the, the, it just wasn't the right thing. And you try and reframe those. I do think that we owe it to ourselves and to the people that we know to try and generate some wins here and there and try and help other people generate wins. Um, you know, in running a lab over the years, and I still do, um, you realize that you want your students to publish a paper and feel that success pretty early so that they can experience, A, how much work it is, so they pick problems wisely, but B, so they can feel that, like, oh, I can do this. And I think that, um, you know, this gets into the psychological as well. I think that, yes, failures help, but successes help. And there I think, you know, I function best in a team. And I think that for those of you that are, feel like you're fighting some challenge alone, I do think that there are great resources to be had in trying to access other, you know, other people as sources of support. I, I think that that's a great tool. There's this whole s literature, scientific literature, around social connection and how that can help us reframe motivation and goals. Anyway, maybe that's a topic to, to ex expand on another time, but uh, failure is important on a trial, trial by basis. It, people who don't experience enough wins for a long period of time, the brain is a prediction machine after all, and they start to predict failure. So it takes a bit more work to wedge oneself out of that. Rule number three, get morning sunlight. I would absolutely anchor my physiology with morning sunlight viewing. I can't help it. You know what's interesting? I'll tell you very briefly. You know what's special about morning sunlight? This low ang solar angle sunlight. I, have, I don't think I've talked about this much on social media or on the podcast. There's a group at the University of Washington, a couple, Jay and Maureen Knights. They run a lab together. That sounds like a horrible thing but they do it and they get along very well. And they've discovered that the cells in your eye, the neurons that set your circadian clock, make you alert during the day and make you sleepy at night and so on. Those cells respond best to yellow-blue contrast and orange tones. Now, this is important because when you go out in the morning even if it's not at sunrise, but it's close to sunrise, or you look at the sun in the evening, what you'll see is yellow, blue contrast or orange, yellow, blue, orange, that old thing from kindergarten or first grade. That's not the color of light that you're going to see when the sun is overhead. Now, this also is really interesting because artificial lights, at least to my understanding, even the daylight simulators have not picked up on this. It's just about bright light. Someone ought to design something that can mimic this, but 
Nature has done this beautifully for us. And so viewing low solar angle sunlight in the morning and in the evening is most effective because of those yellow blue contrasts. Now here's the really wild thing. Those circuits that set your levels of alertness and sleep, yes, they respond best to yellow blue contrast, but what that tells us is crazy. What that means is that color vision was probably not related to color perception first because all of that is completely subconscious. The pathways that do this are present in people who are pattern vision blind. So what do I mean? I mean that color vision likely evolved from a need to synchronize your internal state with the external world and the best stimulus in the outside world to do that is yellow-blue contrast. In other words, our ability to detect color was first and foremost, and we understand this based on evolutionary genomics and so forth, to extract time of day information, not color of fruit or color of skin or anything like that. That's all secondary, which is wild and crazy. And this is yet another example of the way we think things work is not the way they work. It's completely 180 degrees opposite. And I'm just gonna give you a little teaser. I had a guest on the podcast. He hasn't, we haven't aired the episode yet. His name is Eric Jarvis. He works on speech and language. He also was admitted into the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. Again, who are these people? He's a professor at the Rockefeller. Anyway, I learned from Eric, and you'll learn when that episode comes out, that you only find elaborate speech and language in species that also engage in dance and song. And the genomics point to the fact that song and singing came first and language came second. And that led me during that episode of the podcast, I wrote down in my notes, I was listening to him talk and I wrote down in my notebook, it's just scrawled in big letters, it says, I am so happy right now. <laughs> I was just blown away. I couldn't, and it makes so much sense when you hear it, that the colors in the sky were what we, our system is trying to extract, not a perception of those colors in the sky because they're informing us about time and orienting us in time. That song and the communication of emotional states would be simpler and more foundational than communication about specific patterns of language. When you hear it, suddenly it makes sense. But of course, we're human beings and unless you're Eric Jarvis or Ali Crum or Anna Lemke, you think about all this stuff backwards. Rule number four, try intermittent fasting. I happen to be an omnivore. My goal is always to eat high quality, minimally or non-processed foods and to eat things in moderation. So I do eat some meat from sustainable sources or from organic sources. I eat uh, some starches and I eat vegetables and I eat fruits. I try not to eat sugars and I don't really like highly processed foods at this point in my life. That's me. That's what I do. But I'm certainly not dictating what people should eat. I know certain people are ketogenic and I can say that for people who achieve ketosis and can get into ketosis, yes, indeed, there is a mental state associated with ketosis that will allow your brain to function and to think really clearly that many people find very attractive and keep them going back over and over again to a ketogenic diet. I'm somebody who, for instance, has not been in ketosis many times in my life, at least not deliberately so, but I actually will ingest liquid ketones from time to time because of the further cognitive enhancement or physical enhancement that I experience on top of nutrition that does include some carbohydrates. So there are a lot of different ways to approach all this. Whether or not you're a vegan, omnivore, vegetarian, carnivore, et cetera, the point is this. Your ability to focus, and in fact, your ability of neurons to encode specific information in your environment, that is to represent what's out there in the world, is actually related to your blood glucose level. Now, here I'm setting aside the discussion of ketosis and, and ketogenic diets for the moment. But there's a beautiful study that was published in Neuron not long ago that showed that the tuning, that is the precision with which neurons in the brain represent things in our environment, is actually much greater when there is sufficient glucose in the brain. Translated into English, this means that when we are fasted or when our blood glucose is very low, we aren't able to perceive and think about things as clearly. Now, there's a twist to this, however. Many people who practice intermittent fasting, and I should say I practice a sort of pseudo-intermittent fasting. I generally eat my meals between the hours of 11 a.m. and 8 p.m., although sometimes there's some wiggle around that. Occasionally, I have an early breakfast. I'm not super rigid about it. But I know there are a number of people who are doing longer fasts or they're eating in a six-hour window. We did an entire episode about fasting. You can, again, find that at HubermanLab.com. We'll likely have Sachin Panda, who's an expert in intermittent fasting, on the podcast. Intermittent fasting has a lot of different potential benefits. For some people, it's a convenient way to restrict their calories. For other people, it's a convenient way to avoid eating. That is, it's easier to not eat than to eat a small portion, so they opt for intermittent fasting. 
and so on and so forth. But one of the things that you hear very often is that some people like being fasted because they like the clarity of mind that it provides. Here's the situation. Neurons, unless you're in a ketogenic diet, really thrive on glucose. They love glucose. And as I mentioned before, your ability to think and perceive things is actually enhanced by having sufficient glucose in your bloodstream. So why would it be that some people experience a heightened state of mental clarity when they are fasted? I've certainly experienced that before. Well, I should say that provided you're well hydrated enough and you have enough electrolytes in your system, what tends to happen is that when you ingest food, there's a shift in your nervous system towards so-called parasympathetic mode. That is the more relaxed, you probably heard it as rest and digest, although it does other things, a more relaxed mode that can indeed make us very sleepy. If we have too many carbohydrates, it actually can make us quite sleepy. However, if we have any food, if we have enough of it, that is if our gut is full, it diverts blood to our gut and we become sleepy and we can't focus as well. So a lot of people really like fasting in the state of being fasted for focus and concentration because they don't have as much of that parasympathetic activation. They're just not as sleepy. And in fact, under those conditions, half as much caffeine will give you just as much lift as twice as much caffeine will give you on a full belly of pasta. And that's just the way that caffeine interacts with blood glucose. So what I'd like you to imagine is if you had a measure of focus from zero to 10, these are arbitrary units, 10 being maximally focused and zero being not focused at all. Imagine a U-shaped function, right? Where if you're very fasted, you're going to have a high degree of focus and concentration. But then if you ingest some food and your belly is full, your focus and concentration is reduced. But having enough blood glucose and maybe even elevated blood glucose will increase cognitive function. So there are two ends of the spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, blood glucose is relatively low and you're fasted and you can think and behave in a very concentrated way. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of blood glucose, or I should say sufficient blood glucose. You never want your blood glucose to be too high. And that allows your neurons to encode and perceive and basically allow you to think really clearly. So you sort of have to pick your condition. What do you want for your bouts of focus and concentration? I actually do both. So what I do is, as I mentioned before, I eat my meal sometime around 11 a.m., my first meal typically, unless I'm very hungry when I wake up. And so I will do my workout and one bout of focused work. I always think of this as my hard work early in the day. And I do that fasted. I'll be consuming water with electrolytes, maybe element or other electrolytes, maybe some caffeine as well in the form of yerba mate or coffee. That's my first focus bout of 90 minutes or less. That is essentially done fasted. And then I'll eat. And then I do notice after I eat, I actually have a diminished capacity to focus. But then again, in the afternoon, I will do another 90 minute bout of focus. And I'll talk about some of the tools I use to make sure that that bout of focus is optimal for getting the most amount of focused work done, whether or not it's mental work or physical work, although I tend to do my physical work early in the day and my mental work both early and late in the day. So to make this very simple or as simple as I can for you, being fasted is great for focus and concentration, provided you're not thinking about food the entire time. And being fed is terrific for focus and concentration, actually can improve neuronal function, provided that you didn't eat too much food. So one way to manage this is if you're going to have a lunch to make sure that you don't stuff yourself at lunch, that you're not overeating and to not get quite so full that you push your nervous system into this parasympathetic mode and make it hard to focus in the afternoon. I know a lot of people experience a dip or even a crash in energy in the afternoon that make it really hard to focus. For that reason, I'll just remind people of a tool I've talked about many times before, which is based on the biology of adenosine and caffeine, et cetera, which is to delay your first caffeine intake to 90 to 120 minutes after waking up. I know that can be painful for certain people. I violate that rule when I'm working out very early in the morning. I'll drink my caffeine before my workout, which often occurs within you know 30 to 60 minutes of waking. But in general, unless I'm working out very early, I will ingest my caffeine 90 to 120 minutes after I wake up. So again, I want to emphasize that if you hear somebody out there say, being fasted is optimal for focus and concentration, well, that is true in one context and perhaps ideal for a certain part of the day. And other people will say, no, you know, neurons run on glucose. You need glucose in your bloodstream in order to get those neurons to be tuned. That is to respond with electrical activity in the optimal way when you're reading something or when you're trying to perform exercise. Well, that's also true. And of course, you can incorporate both. I in fact, as I just described, incorporate both fasted states and fed states in order to optimize my concentration and focus. 
Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, reset your energy levels. Non-destructive ways to reset your dopamine and your energy levels and do those at least every three days. So for me, it was kind of a, a tough thing to take a long walk or to spend, I used to work really hard on Mondays, really hard on Tuesdays, and I would not go in until the afternoon on Wednesdays, and sometimes not at all. And then I'd go in Thursday, Friday, and work really, really hard, and then not at all on Saturday, and then maybe do a little bit of work from home on Sunday, and I was very productive that way. The, those breaks are absolutely key, and it's not encouraged so much in academic or tech or maybe anything now. I hear about so much stress and overwork. I say you just do it and define the culture and let the results and your focus be the, the thing that defines you, not how many hours you're in there. But I realize there's a huge cognitive load and energetic load. And for that, I do think these non-sleep deep rest protocols are where it comes in really handy. There are at least two faculty I know at Stanford, one who's a so-called Howard Hughes investigator, who is big, those are big deal appointments, they get tons of money, et cetera, et cetera. And they do amazing science most of the time. Um, these individuals certainly do. And they take two 20 minute naps per day in their office. When this guy came and visited me years ago when I was at a different university, he took the time that we were supposed to meet in my office and talk about data, he asked if he could take a nap. <laughs> and he gave a great talk that afternoon. So there you go. I, I do think you have to take control of your schedule and do those things. And I hope that helps. And then of course for some people, exercise and so on um, is the way they reset. Rule number six, acknowledge your fears. I do cry, but again about the things I mentioned before. I realized something by the way. We just recorded an episode on grief. It hasn't come out yet. Uh, fascinating topic. Um, I realized at one point by the way, I'll just give this away, that um, I thought I was really sad about losing them. I thought I would tear up really easily because I was sad about them. But then I realized, oh, this, gosh, I can't believe I'm going to do this. But I realized that feeling that I was feeling is the exact same feeling of love that I had when they were alive. So grief is love. And when you look at the literature, it's, it's basically that. But your brain is freaking out because that map of knowing where people are in space and time. Grief is basically a remapping of the space. Where are they? Time. When are they? And then this at kind of abstract map representation that we call closeness. And grief is this process of like ripping ourselves off of that. So in any event, what do I fear talking about things like this? Um, what do I fear? Um, quite honestly, the, my biggest fear, the thing that would just make me feel just horrible is I, I fear letting down my friends. I have an amazing, uh, I love my family and they're wonderful, but I have this in, incredible relationship to friendship and um, I just, I adore my friends and I would sooner give up all my limbs and die before I would, I would deliberately let them down. So there you go. That's what I fear most. Rule number seven, learn to spike adrenaline. This is a wild literature and I love it and it's changing the way that I do things. I thought that to remember things, you're supposed to get really, really excited, really focused and remember them. And guess what? That's not how you do it. There's, there are data and there are stories going back to medieval times that they used to teach kids things and then throw them in the river. There's a beautiful annual review of neuroscience written by the late James McGaw, a brilliant researcher who taught me that in this review. And it turns out that if you want to remember something, you want to spike adrenaline after you acquired that information, after. That means the double espresso and the ice bath after you study for math, immediately after. And you think about this, you know, that makes perfect sense, right? Think about 
the one trial learning that nobody wants to experience, which is a car accident or some traumatic thing. You didn't get the spike of adrenaline first, you got the spike of adrenaline after. So again, you know, I discourage the use of excessive stimulants or you know, anything like that, but if you're going to try and remember information, you need to get your brain and body into a high autonomic arousal state. Literally, you need to deploy adrenaline into your system after you have made the attempt to learn some information. So much so that if you give people a beta blocker after learning emotional information, they don't learn it as well. Incredible. Just incredible data in animals and humans. This is the, the beautiful work of Larry Cahill at UC Irvine and James McGaw. So that's how I would focus on remembering things better. And it's also true that if you tell yourself that something's really important to you, you'll, you'll be able to learn it better. If you meet people and they tell you their name and you forget two seconds later, well, you should probably be thinking, and now I do this, I meet people and I think, okay, what, what terrible thing did this person do? Just try and spike my adrenaline or something like that. It's a terrible trick, but I haven't figured out a better way. But that's actually one that data supported way to do that. Um, uh, easily a dozen or more studies in humans on that very topic. Rule number eight, tame social media use. You hear all the terrible ways in which it's changing our brains. And I think that, again, I, we go back to this thing, is, is it the aperture that we're looking at? So is it the format that we're engaging in things? Or is it the content? Well, the way I like to think about the phone is the way that we've been engaging with the phone and the laptop, for that matter, in staring into the small visual aperture each day is sort of like walking like this all day long. Right? We have this amazing ability to shuffle our feet and take small steps or to take big strides, to run, to move. I think that's the sagittal plane for movement. I know it for the brain, but it always mess. The PTs are vicious people online, by the way. The PTs and nutrition people, I've, I've learned to just not, not say anything about that. I'm not a PT and I'm not a physical therapist. And they, they do incredible work, but they're like, it's a very spirited crowd. And the nutrition thing is really weird how they're, I mean, it's just incredible. You're either, people are either throwing liver at you or they're throwing celery at you or they're, they're fasting or they're not fasting. It's nuts. In any case, the social media and staring at a small visual aperture is changing our brains. Here's one way I know in which it's changing our brains and then I'll tell you how to fix it. If you stare or look at something to within two feet of you for a certain number of hours each day, your eyeball actually gets longer. And the visual image then is focused in front of your neural retina, not onto your neural retina, and you are becoming myopic, nearsighted. And if you look at things in the distance enough, guess what? Your eyeball changes shape and your lens will focus appropriately the image onto your retina, take some work. Kids that look at things up close too much and adults that look at things up close too much become nearsighted. And there's a beautiful set of clinical trials now where mainly in kids, if kids get outside for two hours a day, getting a lot of this UVB and blue light that we're told is so terrible for us, but they get it from sunlight, they actually can reverse myopia or reduce the incidence of myopia, maybe even glaucoma, although that's a big maybe. So how much staring into a small visual aperture is too much? I don't know. But what we do know is that we are literally becoming myopic in terms of our vision and we're becoming myopic in terms of our cognition. And then there's the whole business of what's actually contained in those tweets and those social media feeds and those news stories, which frankly, I feel like you lose either way. Whether or not you're in one political camp or another political camp, you're upset about half of the information out there. So I feel like it's, you know, I, and I'm not a, I, I'm not someone who knows how to talk about politics without stumbling. I didn't do well in social studies um, and this sort of thing. It just never made sense to me. It just felt like the, the, the prize goes to the person who can shout the loudest and the most coherently for a moment. So, but I encourage, of course, people to be politically active. <laughs> and I vote. But, but the, the content is tricky to navigate and I can't really speak to that except that it seems to be bothering everybody on one side or the other or in the middle. And 
the format is something that we really understand. And again, I don't know of many people that are talking about this narrow visual window format thing. It came up more during the lockdowns when we were all inside a lot and not looking out at a distance. The, the data say to really to try and get at least 10 minutes of long distance viewing, so longer than 10 feet away from us for every 30 minutes of close up viewing and not a lot of us are doing that. If you're walking to your car looking at your phone, you're definitely losing an opportunity. Rule number nine, moderate caffeine intake. I know many people are curious as to whether or not caffeine can improve focus and concentration. And indeed, it can. There is an immense amount of data supporting the idea that caffeine, provided it's consumed in the appropriate dosages, can improve mental performance and physical performance. And it largely does that through improvements in focus and concentration. The dosage of caffeine, of course, is going to depend on how caffeine adapted you are, how much caffeine tolerance you have. And that is going to vary tremendously depending on whether or not you ingest that caffeine with or without food, as I mentioned earlier. But there is a kind of general range in which we can talk about caffeine as being useful for focus and concentration. And the range is basically from 100 milligrams to 400 milligrams. I want to caution everybody out there. If you're somebody who suffers from anxiety or panic attacks and you're not used to ingesting caffeine and you run out and ingest 400 milligrams of caffeine in the form of espresso or yerba mate or an energy drink or in pill form, that is going to be very uncomfortable for you. You're going to be sweating profusely. Your heart rate is going to increase. You're going to be quite panicked, uh, in fact, or at least anxious. So be cautious with your use and adopting of caffeine if you're not already caffeine adapted. But most people do quite well to ingest 100 to 200 milligrams of caffeine prior to doing some focused work. And again, I recommend delaying your caffeine intake to 90 to 120 minutes after waking, unless you are using that caffeine to really jolt your system uh, before a workout. Caffeine can, of course, be ingested in various forms, even pill form, but most people ingest it in the form of coffee, or my particular favorite way to ingest caffeine is yerba mate. Um, it is important, and I should note that you should actively avoid the smoked versions of yerba mate as they contain a lot of carcinogenic, cancer-promoting compounds. There's some great yerba mate brands out there that most cost-effective way to consume it would be to use the loose leaf tea and to, to pour water over that. There's one particular brand that I like. I don't have any affiliation to them whatsoever, but I've been using it for years. It's Anna Park. It's an organic brand that is sold. I buy mine on Amazon, but you can find it elsewhere on the internet as well. Again, I don't have any affiliation to them. It's just very cost-effective, very clean. It doesn't have the smoked flavor, at least the one that I buy is not the smoked variety, so none of the carcinogenic compounds are in there, at least that I'm aware of. And I like the way it tastes and it provides a very even lift and, and stimulant uh, that I think certainly works for me and that a number of people I know that have suggested to also enjoy. Yerba mate or caffeine also have other additional benefits. In particular, the caffeine in yerba mate and coffee and other sources of caffeine are known to increase the density and efficacy, that is the number and the function of dopamine receptors. And this has been shown in humans several times. So by ingesting caffeine pretty regularly, you're actually increasing the ability of dopamine to have this effect of increasing motivation and drive. I tend to ingest caffeine only early in the day. I tend to cut off my caffeine intake somewhere around 1 or 2 p.m. to ensure that I can get into a good night's sleep. But I realize that there are people out there that ingest caffeine as late as 2 or 3 in the afternoon and can still sleep fine. I will caution those of you that think that you can drink caffeine in the evening or nighttime and still fall asleep. All of the research points to the fact that the architecture of your sleep and the depth of your sleep is disrupted even if you're able to fall and stay asleep, the sleep you're getting is simply not as good as the sleep you would get if you were to shut off your caffeine intake at least eight hours before bedtime and ideally more like 10 or even 12 hours before bedtime. But of course, there are practical constraints as well. Okay, so caffeine is increasing dopamine's function by changing the number and efficacy of dopamine receptors. But of course, it also increases our wakefulness, our alertness. And that is largely through the neurochemical systems related to adenosine, which is a molecule that builds up in our brain and body the longer we are awake. It's part of the sleepiness system, if you will. It makes us feel fatigued or tired. And caffeine also operates on the epinephrine, the adrenaline system. In fact, if we ingest too much caffeine, we'll sometimes get the jitters. Those jitters are really the sympathetic, as it's called, nervous systems, bias toward movement. And our pupils will dilate. They actually get broader. Now, 
somewhat paradoxically, when our pupils get bigger, the pupils of our eyes, that is, our visual world actually narrows. It becomes more tunnel-like. A lot of people don't realize this. When our pupils are really small, that means we are relaxed. So if you ever see someone with really tiny sort of you know, pin-sized pupils, they're very relaxed. If their pupils are very big, they're very dilated, well, then they are very amped up. They're vi they are very, very alert. Caffeine increases alertness by increasing epinephrine, adrenaline release, both in the brain and within the body. And so that's another way that it facilitates focus and concentration. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is control alcohol consumption. I acknowledge that I've mainly talked to you about the negative effects of alcohol. I want to acknowledge that many people enjoy alcohol in moderation or even light drinking, the occasional drink or the occasional two drinks, or maybe even on average one drink per night, so seven drinks per week. I'm certainly not here to tell you what to do and what not to do. I do find it immensely interesting, however, that first of all, alcohol is a known toxin to the cells of the body. Some of you might immediately say, well, wait, what about hormesis? What about this phenomenon where if we regularly ingest a toxin, it makes us stronger? In other words, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Yeah, there's you know some reason to believe that might be beneficial in terms of some forms of cellular resilience, maybe, maybe, no, sorry. It doesn't work that way. There are processes of hormesis in which, for instance, exposing yourself safely to increases in adrenaline through you know ice baths or other things that increase adrenaline can raise your so-called stress threshold. But here we're talking about cellular stress and damage to cells. So my read of the literature, and again, this is my read, and I invite others to, you know, provide studies, or I would prefer actually collections of studies that point in the direction, if they exist, that alcohol can be beneficial. But my read of the literature, or I should say, my understanding of what I would call the center of mass of the literature on alcohol is that no consumption, zero consumption, consumption of zero ounces of alcohol is going to be better for your health than low to moderate consumption of alcohol. And that low to moderate consumption of alcohol is going to be better for you, of course, than moderately high to high alcohol consumption on the order of 12 to 24 or more drinks per week. I realize that for most people listening to this, it's probably low to moderate alcohol consumption that is part of their standard repertoire. And I'm not here to give you justification for doing that, nor am I gonna tell you not to do that. I would like you to consider perhaps, however, the negative effects that we understand and that are documented. For instance, the negative effects of alcohol in the gut microbiome and the things that you can do to better support your gut microbiome. The negative effects on the stress system, that HPA axis that we talked about earlier, and the fact that even low to moderate levels of alcohol consumption can increase our levels of stress when we're not drinking. And to think about acquiring some tools and, you know, getting some proficiency with tools, behavioral or otherwise, that can help you with stress modulation that don't involve alcohol consumption. So again, the point here is to illustrate where the problems lie with alcohol consumption, but also what I've tried to do is to point you to some resources that can help offset some of those negative effects. Will they offset all the effects? I can't say that for sure, but certainly taking measures to offset some of the negative effects of any alcohol consumption that you might be having or doing is going to be beneficial to you. People form these associations, whether or not through experience or through indirect experience of observing others. I think public speaking is one of the greatest fear of dying. Yeah, you know, it's funny, I don't, it's not funny, but uh, figure of speech, I never think about dying and being afraid of dying. I think about all the scary things that could happen while I'm living. But there are many people who are just intrinsically afraid of dying. And so that's, that's a big one. Um, for people that uh, don't swim, fear of drowning. For people that swim, less so. Um, for people that have some sort of psychiatric disorder, genuine psychiatric disorder, like obsessive compulsive disorder, which is not just pers obsessive compulsive personality, but obsessive compulsive disorder, fear of, the sh of being discovered and the shame that they have around their obsessions and compulsions. These are, v v o true OCD is very common. Do they all uh, live in the same place? All of these different fears that all exist so, yeah, in the same So I place. was rattling off and I didn't answer your question um, to the, the more important point. So forgive me. 
The short answer is they have a final common pathway, which is increased autonomic arousal, and that is funneled through a couple what we call limbic structures, among others. So there's certainly involvement of the of the now famous amygdala, this which means almond is this almond shaped structure on the two sides of the brain. There's also an area of the brain called the stria terminalis that's also involved in fear. And then the hypothalamus, this small collection of neurons just above the roof of your mouth, which is really, to me, one of the more fascinating areas of the brain, harbors neurons that create a body-wide and brain-wide response to something that the higher order areas of the brain, like the forebrain, see and perceive as dangerous, as threatening. So the short answer is yes, it all funnels through hypothalamus, amygdala, stria terminalis, and autonomic nervous system. That's a final common pathway. But in terms of the variety of different things that can stimulate fear and the ways that they can do that, that is highly contextual. So the forebrain, this real estate in the brain right behind the forehead, is incredible because it's sort of free real estate for you to customize for your life according to what happens to you early on. So for instance, you might not be at all afraid of heights and you say, well, why is that so? Well, maybe when you were a kid, you were one of those maniacs that like, you know, doing, in the States, we call them cherry drops, the kids that could, you know, swing on their feet and then jump off the, the bar. And, and then other kids are timidly crawling to the top of the thing, don't even want to go up the ladder to the slide. There's a ton of variation, and that variation does not exist in the kind of deeper circuitry, the final common path circuitry. It exists in the learning that we experienced early in life. One bad fall, can do it. I mean, I was bitten very badly by a German shepherd when I was a kid. Head eye, almost got my eye, but you know, for whatever reason, I've always liked dogs anyway. But there are other things that I've experienced that have left long-term negative imprints. So I, it's highly contextual. And a lot of it has to do with what happens immediately after the bad experience. This is why nowadays there's a, a lot of legal use of the drug ketamine after traumas, you know, this is all very dark stuff, unfortunately, but if you, you know, you just imagine the family member that was just in a car crash and saw their, the driver, their loved one impaled onto the steering column. I mean, what could be more horrible than that? Nowadays, if they come into the emergency room, they will often give them an injection of ketamine, which is a dissociative anesthetic to get them to dissociate from this extreme emotional state. So there are ways now to treat this, um, and ketamine is used uh, clinically at later periods too. And nowadays, there's a ton of interest in social media and in video games. And it, there have been some measurements of the amount of dopamine released. Video games, especially video games that have a very high update speed where there's novel territory all the time, no, novelty is a big stimulus of dopamine. Those can release dopamine somewhere between nicotine and cocaine. So very high levels of dopamine release. Social media is an interesting one because the amount of dopamine that's released in response to logging onto social media initially could be quite high, but it seems like likely that there's a taper in the amount of dopamine, but, and yet people still get addicted. So why, why is it that we can get addicted to things that fail to get to elicit the same massive amount of pleasure that they initially did? Being addicted to something isn't just about the fact that it feels so good that you want to do it over and over again. And that's because of this pleasure pain balance that underlies motivation. So let's look a little bit closer at the pleasure pain balance because therein lies the tools for you to be able to control motivation toward healthy things and avoid motivated behaviors towards things that are destructive for you. There are a lot of reasons why people try novel behaviors, whether or not those are drugs or whether or not those are adventure thrill seeking things or they seek out new partners or, you know, they take a new class. As you'll notice, I'm not placing any judgment or value on these different behaviors, although I think it's fair to point out that for most people, addictive drugs like cocaine and amphetamine are very destructive. Actually, we know that about 15 to 20 percent of people have a genetic bias towards addiction that, you know, you sometimes hear that the first time that you use a drug, you can become addicted to it. That's actually not been shown to be true for most things and most people, but for some people that actually is true. And we'll talk a little bit later about why certain people are heavily biased toward becoming addicts on the first use of a particular drug. It's actually very interesting. It has everything to do with whether or not they were formally addicted to something else. But in any case, the way that addiction works and the way that motivation works generally in the non-addictive setting is that when you anticipate something, a little bit of dopamine is released. And then when you reach that thing, you engage in that thing, 
the amount of dopamine goes up even further. But as you repeatedly pursue a behavior and you repeatedly engage with a particular thing, let's say you love running or you love chocolate. As you eat a piece of chocolate, believe it or not, it tastes good. And then there's a shift away from activation of dopamine. And there are other chemicals that are released that trigger a low level sense of pain. Now you might not feel it as physical pain, but the craving that you feel is both one part dopamine and one part the mirror image of dopamine, which is the pain or the craving for yet another piece of chocolate. And this is a very important and subtle feature of the dopamine system that's not often discussed. People always talk about just as pleasure. You love social media, so it gives you dopamine, and so you engage in that. You like chocolate, it releases dopamine, so you do that. But for every bit of dopamine that's released, there's another circuit in the brain that creates, you can think of it as kind of like a downward deflection in pleasure. So you engage in something you really want, and there's an increase in pleasure. And then there's a, without you doing anything, there's a mirror image of that, which is a downward deflection in pleasure, which we're calling pain. So for every bit of pleasure, there is a mirror image experience of pain and they overlap in time very closely. So it's sometimes hard to sense this, but try it. The next time you eat something really delicious, you'll take a bite. It tastes delicious. And part of the experience is to want more of that thing. This is true for any pleasureful experience. Now, the diabolical part about dopamine is that because it didn't evolve in order to get you to indulge in more and more and more of something, what happens is that initially you experience an, in, an increase in pleasure and you also experience this increase in pain shortly after or woven in with the pleasure that makes you want more of that thing. But with each subsequent time, that you encounter that thing, that you pursue the chocolate, that you, uh, you pursue the lover. Each time, the experience of dopamine release and pleasure is diminished a little bit. And the diabolical thing is that the pain response is increased a little bit. And this is best observed in the context of drug-seeking behavior. The first time someone decides to take cocaine or amphetamine, they may do it out of boredom. They may do it out of peer pressure. They may do it to relieve some internal sense. Maybe they're bored or they're just excited. Maybe they're high in novel novelty seeking. There are a lot of reasons why people might try a drug far too many for us to, you know, to get into or parse here. Maybe they don't even want to do it, but someone encourages them. They will experience a huge dopamine release and they will feel likely very good. However, the next time they take it, it won't feel quite as good and it won't feel even as good the third time or the next time. But the amount of pain, the amount of craving that they experience for the drug will increase over time. So much of our pursuit of pleasure is simply to reduce the pain of craving. So the next time you experience something you really like, I don't want to take you out of that experience, but it's really important that you notice this, that if there's something you really enjoy, part of that enjoyment is about the anticipation and wanting of more of that thing. And that's the pain system in action. Learning to cultivate a, a, a life of focus, and I should say it should be produ the way to support that is to have components of your day of wordlessness and defocus. I do want to emphasize that because it's not about waking up and from morning till till night being ultra focused, right? I don't, I don't, I don't do the make my bed first thing. I admit it. I, I sometimes like it happens <laughs> midday. Okay, All right. I wouldn't make it in the military, but we knew that already anyway. So the, you know, the it's about being in in recognition of where you're at and focused and dropping in deeply for certain portions of the day. But I also have a deliberate decompress time of my day, right? I take 30 minutes a day and I either take a nap or I do a yoga nidra or I just let my mind go. But that does mean not mindless scrolling. Although I do some mindless scrolling too. I allow myself that. But having periods of the day where you let the mind defocus and just kind of drift in the same way that your mind drifts a bit during sleep, that is what allows you to focus. So it, it very intensely afterward or on a consistent basis. So it's not about being a, a total animal from morning till night and then just expecting to switch, you know, switch off the, the thinking and go right to sleep. It's about, for me, there are really two blocks, two 90 minute blocks, one early in the day and one later in the day where I commit to doing really focused work twice a day. And I have to fight tooth and nail to create the space for those and to make sure it happens. And if it, and I fail a lot, you know, if, if, 
something gets in the way and I don't do that, I, um, I just try and get back on track as quickly as possible. I don't bring my phone. I, t I put my phone on airplane mode when I'm training and doing any kind of physical work now, because it's just too distracting. People that are always in anticipation and desire and seeking, that's wonderful for pursuing goals. However, it's terrible for enjoying life. And actually, those people are actually quite difficult to be around. There's a certain almost um, sociopathic element to people who are what they call hyper dopaminergic, people who are always on the dopaminergic scale to the point where they are always pursuing goals. In fact, those people are known to be, um, at least in the psychological spectrum, they can be very manipulative. You know, dopamine and the pursuit of something doesn't necessarily have to be high energy and intense from the outside when you observe it from the outside. In fact, um, there are people who will manipulate in order to get what they want. This has been shown who have high levels of dopamine release in their brain, but they've learned that a kind of passive manipulation is the best way to maneuver through a particular environment. Now, I don't want to focus too much on um, sociopathy because those are kind of extreme examples, but it just goes to show that people who identify a goal and realize the series of steps that they need to take in order to achieve that goal can either do it through ethical means or non-ethical means. They can do it through active pursuit, being the kind of type A person that's always declaring their goals and going after it, posting it on Instagram, telling everybody about it, trying to recruit others. There's that phenotype. There's that kind of signature of dopamine. And then there are the people that want to get what they want and they're doing it by always serving other people, by always taking care of everybody else's needs, by always trying to accomplish their goals, but through a mode that at least from the outside seems more passive or more about supporting others. Neither of these are good or bad. And that's because dopamine is a molecule. It doesn't care how you reach your goals. It only cares that you reach your goals because the, sen the internal sensation is one again of mild pleasure a little bit of pain, although more pain over time if you're not reaching those goals, and it takes you away from the here and now. I've all heard the sayings, you know, how do you, you know, journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, or how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, mm -hmm. or, you know, all, there are all these sayings, and, and it, you know, it goes back to the Bible and earlier, yeah. right? I mean, this is not new, these are not new sayings, but they're showing up in different forms. What's lost in those short descriptions, however, is that Every step is not equivalent. If it were just that a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, everyone would pursue their goals. Everyone would push back against adversity. Everyone, I mean, you can read the inspirational stories as many times as one needs. And I do think inspirational stories are of very high value. In fact, I think they're vicarious dopamine. I think they give us the sense that we could, which then hope. orients hope which then orients us to the world to again. To start, yeah, yeah. So right. it's po maybe it's possible for me. That's right. So let's say, um, let's take the example of somebody who's... Um, but with this finish, that's that story of, it's not about just taking a single step and one step at a time. Is it because there's adversities every 10 steps you go, and so it's harder and harder? So it's not it, just well, it's just very non-linear. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's some days go, you know, I know this from my scientific career, it's, you know, some days it's easy, some days it's hard, it's all over the place, mm -hmm. right? So I think the thing to remember is that dopamine is this incredibly powerful molecule that allows us to buffer the effort process. It allows us to be in effort longer and it allows us to actually eventually enjoy the process of effort. And not think about the reward, but just say, oh, I'm enjoying the process. Right. Well, you just described the first step. The first step in learning to attach dopamine to the effort process, which is the key operation in order to succeed, is to... Be very careful about how much you focus on the end goal. Keeping the goal in mind is important for like a proper orientation. You have to know the ultimate destination. But if at any point we were to evaluate our progress relative to that end goal, or if we don't know what the end goal is, there's a huge gap there. Right. And it can feel overwhelming. And depressing and I'm not good enough. That's and right. I should just give up. What am I doing this for? That's right. And it's those a, thoughts will affect us. And they're very realistic. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, as Carol will say, and other people have said in the psychology field, you know, positive self-talk, oftentimes, unless you do it correctly, you're badly wrong. Mm. You know, lying to yourself won't work. Saying, right. saying, I'm, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, when, when you haven't lost, won, or you haven't won yet, <laughs> yeah. is, is great, but that's not the most effective use of these systems. Well, you're also being out of integrity with yourself. You're, you're telling yourself a lie. Right. You're like, and then you're 
losing your ability to have confidence because you're just lying to yourself. Right. And if it's really extreme, there's a name for it. It's called delusional, right? <laughs> right. right? And people will start to point that out, and then it becomes harder to recruit people into your, your goals. So I think the key thing is to attach that sense of reward to the effort process. It's saying, look, I am oriented in the right direction and rewarding the things you're not doing. I'm not back on my heels. I'm not just staying, you know, I'm bad in the morning. I'm not, yeah. A good example of this came to me recently. I have a good friend. He did nine years in the SEAL teams. His name is Pat Dossett. And, and we were talking about, you know, the, the Admiral McRaven thing, you know, get up and make your bed. And, you know, and they, they really do that. And, and I think the way it was described was, um, you know, so at the end of the day, even if everything doesn't go well, your bed is still made. Mm-hmm. For me, that's not that big of a reward, frankly. Right. I, but I, and so I said that. and I, <laughs> I what, love it, though. I make my bed. Well, been... Oh, I definitely made my bed in the morning. <laughs> but, I mean, it, going back and seeing that at the end of a hard day, mm-hmm. it, it's not enough. It, I felt like there was something else there. Mm-hmm. So I asked him, he said, well, it's very interesting because part of it is about not just making your bed, but it's the things you're not doing by making your bed. You're not lying in bed and ruminating. Mm. You're not back on your heels. You're not on your phone. That's right. Yeah. When, so when you look at, and you have spent a lot of time with people in mm. high performing communities, mainly through some consulting work, but what you find is that, you know, we can all be either be back on our heels, flat footed or forward center of mass. Forward, yeah. And when you look at people who are in these high performance communities, they try and keep their center of mass forward. Almost through what seem like trivial things, like making your bed or making the cup of coffee, but it's not just Washing about what teeth, you're doing, like, yeah. it's all the things you're not doing that can put you down the path of ruminating or put you down the path of um, unhealthy behavior. So the key to this is, if we wanna be very concrete, we should probably focus on actions, and I'll mm-hmm. use fitness as an example because it translates to everybody, whereas you know, people's circumstances sure. differ. Let's say somebody really wants to take on a fitness routine they hate running or they want to lose weight in a, in a healthy way, this kind of thing. So we've all heard the example, well, you put your shoes by the door on day one, day two, you put them on day three, you go out the door, day four, you walk around the block and then, you know, and then eventually like they're running marathons. Okay. (laughs) Great. But to sustain that behavior or even to make the, the behavior pleasurable and to give you energy, the key is to subjectively reward those steps. So it's not going to be, let's say I go out and I run a mile and my goal is to run 10 miles in a few weeks. The key is, as you're in the strain of that mile, the hard part, you wanna tell yourself, this is the good part. This is the part that gives me energy. And I'll be very surprised if people don't actually feel like they could continue further. So it's a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single, is made up of you know single steps, but the key is to reward the harder steps, not the easier ones and not the ones where you get the thing that you want. Don't reward yourself for putting your shoes on and taking a step outside. You could if that was a huge barrier for you. If it was very hard. If it was very hard for you. But but running the 10 miles that's is hard. Right. Find the wall and push a little bit further through that wall and reward that process. So this is why I think reps in the gym, the, the final reps, like reps to failure, are usually not the best example First of all, most people aren't doing reps to failure and it doesn't Mm -hmm. translate to young kids and stuff where they probably shouldn't be doing heavy reps to failure, this kind of thing. What you want, however, is if you're gonna go there to think about these are the, this is the hard part because that's when adrenaline, norepinephrine are getting maxed out and that's when you have an opportunity to bring dopamine in and teach those neural pathways to slam that back Mm -hmm. down. And I don't wanna um, highlight them too much because they are a very niche and specialized community, but you look at people in special operations, you look at the, um, process like the whole um, evaluation process of who gets in and who doesn't. It's really about putting people into stress and seeing who can not just make it through that stress, but buffer that stress. Reward the process through teamwork. Reward the process of stress through some internal dialogue that has everything to do with not being back on your heels, not being flat-footed, but center of mass forward. And I should also be clear: I'm not talking about everybody being super aggro and always like you know <gasps> work, work, work. Yeah. In, in fact, if you're spending too much epinephrine, if you're too much of an adrenaline junkie, you will burn out eventually, unless you can find ways to recover yourself or to buffer that with dopamine. And the recovery process is especially important. There's a second reward system. So you've got the dopamine system, and I guess to really put a box around it, the subjective reward needs to be done at the hardest portion of a process. The tough conversation with a significant other it's like when it's really tough and you want, you just, it, that's when you want to start telling yourself, 
this is the this is the good part because I'm not speaking, or this is the good part because <laughs> I'm not because, reacting. Right, I'm not reacting, or this is the good part because I'm probably not doing it correctly, but I'm on the right path, right? Um, they're upset, they're not feeling your empathy, you know, this kind of thing, or you're not really understanding what's going on, you're getting frustrated. But if you tell yourself, this is this is the neural pathway getting ground in there, like it really dialed in so that the, the next time this, I'm gonna breeze right past this. Yeah. That's really how the process works. Because dope, remember, no one comes along and drips dopamine in your ear, even if you get a billion dollars, or you win a Nobel Prize, or you win the presidency. It's all internal. Hmm. These neurochemicals are all internal. And while some of them are designed to be released in response to things very reflexively, like um, you know, food, sex, sleep, you know, all these things will trigger these neurochemicals. We have this big forebrain which allows us to place subjective context. Exploring in humans is the extent to which people who can take on adaptive decisions can take that uh, adaptive behaviors, can take that stress response and kind of move the horizon in closer and just focus on, okay, I'm in a high stress regime. This is really painful. We see this in, uh, we work on people with generalized anxiety who are trying to overcome fear of heights and just walking across a virtual height plank can be terrifying for them. But if they can get one step in front of the other, despite high levels of anxiety, they can eventually overcome that. And so we've been looking at everything from how breathing affects the anxiety response to heart rate, pupil size, et cetera. I'd be happy to talk about all that in as much detail as you like. But I think the principle to take away is this, that the growth mindset is not about suppressing anxiety so that you're able to move, cruise through things with ease. That's just one part of it. It's really about trying to understand that stress response as key to your growth. It's absolutely key. And I think people that you know, lift weights or run long distance or are involved in competitive sports, they fundamentally understand this, but even they kind of migrate away from it over time where we, recovery is super important, but you need the stimulus, right? And the stimulus for growth is that stress response. And if you think about it, evolutionarily, let's say we were all living in a little clan here in the Onnit offices, and we didn't know anything about the outside world. We would start to kind of eventually what drove people to leave was they didn't have enough of what they needed. There's this sort of the seeking, right? So if you had enough, everything, you had enough mates, enough food, enough water, you'd be fine. But at some point there was some deprivation. And so we had to do a risk benefit analysis. And so it was really about taking that anxiety and venturing out into the unknown to find resources. Some people died and some people succeeded and they were rewarded. And with that reward came the idea that, ah, there's something about looking out into the environment that's useful that can allow me to have more than I have in the moment. But you can't divorce yourself from the anxiety of wondering whether or not things are going to turn out okay. You can't divorce yourself from the anxiety of, of strain and effort. There's just simply no way. And in fact, you weren't really designed to do it. So to kind of peel this around to a practical answer because I often listeners and you know and people want to know well, what do I do with this is you know I think the field of wellness and biohacking and high performance is great but it lacks definition so one thing I'd really like to see more of in the in these communities and in the scientific community for that matter is more careful definition like what is mindfulness like really what what are we really talking about what is stress and what are stress mitigation processes that are useful so one thing I think is really useful is think about real-time tools versus offline tools. I believe personally that everybody, whether or not they're MMA fighter, they're into CrossFit, they're running ultras, or they're a student in class that doesn't do anything physical, whatever it is, has four tools. One tool to get you to mitigate your stress response in real time. So let's say the stress response hits. You need to keep it, you can't let it go too high or too low. You know, you don't want to suppress it, but something to do that. You also probably want an offline tool that allows you to raise your ceiling on what stress feels like. You know, I'm buds with Wim and I've known him for a long time. And like, you know, I think Wim Hof breathing is in particular is a useful tool for kind of shifting your perception of what stressful is. But it's an offline tool. It's not, you can do it in real time, but it's not, you're not going to start Wim Hof huffing in the middle of your like rolling jujitsu because yeah. your breathing has got to be devoted to other things. So you need offline tools and real-time tools to, to cope with stress. And I think people need real-time tools and offline tools to bring themselves into heightened states of arousal, right? So there are times when there's, when you're actually too low on the arousal plane and the key is to get higher up there where you can access even better levels of performance. And so I think the, the so-called autonomic nervous system, it, it's absolutely under our control. It's a total misnomer. It's just that your heart rate and your breathing are taken care of 
on their own. You don't need to flip the on switch. You wake up every morning and you know, if everything's going well, you're breathing and your heart rate is going the way it should. But you absolutely have levers that you can control and move in order to shift those. And I think that um, there's been a lot of focus on like, okay, breathing is a great tool or you know, the ice bath is a great tool, but we really aren't thinking about what they're best for. And as a result of that, I don't think they'll ever evolve past where they are unless we start thinking, okay, like what's the utility of breath holds? No one can tell me. Like, so my lab is very interested in like in trying to figure out what the utility of breath holds is. Is it better at letting you deal with adrenaline in your system? Is it better at get carbon dioxide tolerance? You know, um, for all the the incredible tools that are out there, there isn't a lot of uh, good information about systematic ways to approach it. And I don't want to peel everything down to like a really reductionist approach. You know, I'm friends with Brian McKenzie and those guys, and mm-hmm. you know, and Brian's about as reductionist as you get in the breathwork community. And I love how quantif- you know, how he loves to quantify everything. That's one of the things that initially brought us together um, as friends and as uh, as you know, sort of informal collaborators. But I think that this world of biohacking needs definition. You know, it's it's kind of ironic that in the weightlifting community, they've really worked things down to a, a kind of a fine science. Whereas in the endurance community, it's kind of like whoever you're listening to seems to be the person who knows the most. And I don't claim to know everything or the most at all. I just would like to see sharper definition on all this stuff about stress, stress mitigation, ice baths, breathing, and so on. The discovery of growth mindset is worth thinking about. So Carol's discovery was these kids that for whatever reason, you know, like doing math problems, even though they knew they couldn't get the answers right. These were sure fail problems. So it's the same kind of people that like doing puzzles. And these kids, not surprisingly, go on to do phenomenally well in a number of different areas of ac- academic pursuit. Uh, you know, but what's interesting about growth mindset is that it seems like there's some attachment of the reward systems of the brain to the action or the pursuit of a goal, not just achieving a goal. And when we step back and we look at what that really entails at a neurochemical level, we have reward systems in the brain. They generally fall into two categories. There are the reward systems that make you feel really good with kind of the here and now and everything that's within the confines of your skin and the things you already have, you know, love of your dog, love of your spouse, um, gratitude for all the things you happen to have. And that, and those are generally governed by the release of molecules like serotonin and oxytocin. Okay. But then there's another reward system, which is the one that drove a lot of human evolution, which is the dopamine reward system. Now, dopamine is a very misunderstood molecule. It's often talked about only in the context of reward. Like I'm going to work to this goal. I'm going to build my company. I'm going to, you know, get tenure as a press, whatever it is. And you reach it and you get this dopamine reward. And indeed that's true. But what's often not discussed is that dopamine is secreted en route to rewards while you pursue rewards. Now, the ability to tap into that system, to subjectively amplify that pathway of reward in pursuit of goals is an absolute game changer when it comes to things like anything challenging that of long duration or uncertainty or getting through this COVID you know, pandemic situation. The, but the amazing thing is, remember, the brain only does five things and we get to decide which of those sensations and perceptions have relevance and which ones don't or which ones are attached to a goal and which ones aren't. So growth mindset in its purest form is the attachment of these reward systems to the effort process, to the friction process, mm-hmm. and not just to obtaining a reward. And just as a kind of final point to that, there's a very um, well-known body of literature in neuroscience, at least among neuroscientists, that talks about something called reward prediction error. And it says, if you can dose the dopamine subjectively as you go through the pursuit of something and then have a lot of dopamine when you reach that thing, it's very likely that you're going to reinforce that circuit. There will be neural plasticity and that circuit will become stronger. So the next time you will revisit those sets of behaviors. The opposite can happen too, where you're in real anticipation of something. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. And then you reach that goal and it's kind of underwhelming. And that generally triggers this the circuit that I referred to earlier, this kind of disappointment or dep- pro-depressive circuit. So dopamine is involved in reward, but it's also involved in the pursuit of rewards. And so as you reach a milestone or as you tell yourself, I'm on the right track, this friction I'm feeling, this late night, this early morning, this hard conversation with somebody that doesn't feel good, I'm going to tell myself this is for a larger purpose. That's that subjective insertion, that abstraction that we were talking about earlier. 
And when you start releasing dopamine to those kinds of things, there's essentially no limit on the number of things you can do or the energy to do them. So just as a last, last point about dopamine, when we're in effort, we're always secreting adrenaline. We're always in pursuit and it's draining. It's tiring. Dopamine has this beautiful capacity to buffer adrenaline. And you know this, you've experienced this before, because if you've ever been working really, really hard, maybe your team is depleted, everything's just a mess and somebody cracks a joke. And all of a sudden in an instant, it's like everything's reframed. That couldn't have been hormonal. Hormones work on that, on the schedule of like hours to days to weeks. It had to be neurochemical. It absolutely had to be neurochemical. And that neurochemical is dopamine. In fact, there's a much better way to maintain ongoing action toward a goal that also involves visualization, but it turns out it's not about visualizing success, it's about visualizing failure. The Balsetis Lab and other labs have looked at whether or not people make progress toward goals of different types, whether or not they're thinking about the goal, they're thinking about that goal line and what they want to achieve, that long-term goal and all the wonderful things associated with it, or whether or not they are thinking about all the ways in which they could fail and route to that goal, right? This is not typically what we are encouraged to do. Typically, we are told, don't imagine failure, push failure out of your mind, only focus on success, you know, fake it till you make it, or it's a phrase that I absolutely hate, uh, frankly, because it's not even clear what that means, and it's not even clear what the ethical form of that is. I think it means continue despite any anxiety or fear that things won't work out. But if you look at the literature, the scientific literature, what the Balsetis lab and other labs have shown is that there's a near doubling, near doubling in the probability of reaching one's goal if you focus ru- routinely on foreshadowing failure. You think about the ways in which things could fail if you take action A or you take action B and instead, therefore, you take action C. You're supposed to think about how things could fail if you don't get up and run each morning if your goal is, say, a fitness goal. So let's use that as an example because even though I realize people are in pursuit of many things, not just fitness, fitness goals and physical goals are a very concrete thing that we can all get on the same page about because they're related to actions. Let's say somebody sets a goal of running five miles four times a week minimum and as many as seven, four times a week minimum before 8 a.m. Okay, in a previous podcast on habits, I talked about the benefits of not necessarily setting specific times that one will do things, but setting time blocks that one will do things. So you say before 8 a.m., you're gonna run five miles and that's gonna happen up to seven days a week. Okay, one version of this would be, okay, sit back in a chair and think about how great you're going to feel and look if you're doing this every day, how your health is going to improve, how everything's going to, your blood markers of lipids, et cetera, are going to improve. Okay, fine. That's the visualization goal of visualizing the end point. Turns out that is far less effective and maybe even counterproductive compared to thinking about what's going to happen if you don't do this, the negative health outcomes that are going to occur, the disappointment you're going to have in yourself, the fact that you're going to wait until 7.30, that's not long enough for many people to run five miles. You go to put it on your shoes, it's going to be pouring rain or even hailing or snowing outside, and now you're not going outside unless you're somebody who's particularly motivated to do that. Okay, so foreshadowing failure turns out to be the best way to motivate toward goal pursuit. In fact, as I mentioned before, there's a near doubling in the likelihood that people will reach goals of any kind when they're constantly thinking about how bad it's going to be if they fail. If we think back to the neural circuit associated with assessing value in our goal pursuits, this makes perfect sense. The amygdala, that center of the brain that's involved in anxiety and fear and worry, well, the amygdala is one of the four core components of our goal setting and goal pursuit circuitry. And there's no bypassing that. There is no one listening to this or watching this whose amygdala is not involved in their goal setting and goal pursuit behavior. And so while I'd love to be able to tell you that all you should think about is rainbows and puppies and all the wonderful, rewarding things that are going to happen when you achieve your goals, the truth is you should be thinking mainly about how bad it's really going to get if you don't do it, how disappointing yourself you're going to feel, how it will negatively impact you, if not in the immediate term, in the long term, if indeed your goal is to reach your goal. So I want to emphasize that I'm not interested in encouraging people to flagellate themselves. I'm encouraging people to 
achieve their goals. And it turns out the best way to do that is by foreshadowing failure. And the more specific you can get by writing down or thinking about or talking about how bad it will be if you don't achieve your goals, the more likely you are to achieve those goals. I really believe that we all have some superpower that reflects, maybe this is a bit of a scientific explanation, that reflects the fact that our biology is tilted in some direction. People often think about their biology being tilted in a direction that doesn't serve them, like, oh, you know, my parents were this, and my, you know, or I'm not a good athlete, or I'm whatever. But it's also tilted in the direction of something really special. So, like, when I was a kid of that age, I was fascinated by animals. I was just like my, and so, had I learned to listen to that more, I used to hide my interest in animals because mm-hmm. I thought it was kind of not, it wasn't cool. Like, I didn't play the guitar in college, I didn't surf. I always, like, like, I can tell you all these facts about mustelids and ferrets. Like, what, what good is that? But, like, you know, but I think that kind of leaning, that kind of tilt towards, like, huh, like, that's me. Like, you resonate with something. Mm-hmm. And I'm not the first to say this. I think Robert Greene also said this. Like, there's a, adults will often remember back to a time where they interacted with something. Sometimes it's an object or sometimes it's an experience. And it just felt so good. Like, it, it kind of drew, drew you in. I would tell your young listeners to, and viewers to really pay attention to that. It can seem almost trivial, like it's rarely about the thing you're looking at or the thing you're doing, but sometimes it's the sensation of running, sometimes it's the, it's, it's the sensation of viewing, seeing something or hearing something, because there's a hint there, and it's, the, it's not really about what you're looking at or you're doing, it's that feeling, like learn it, that feeling is your compass, like that's your true north, because that's the feeling you want to get to for to find you know the mate for your life the you know the partner for your life the 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 career track and over time you're going to pivot right i mean you're not going to get it on the first try i eventually my story of science started there it told me right there i i felt it in that conversation with my dad and then my compass was all over the place and spinning and eventually it's it's come back i found it but getting in, get in touch with that feeling and if this seems at all abstract I would do it as an experiment. I would sit in a chair and I would think about something you don't like, like really don't like, and I would pay attention to what that feels like in your mind and in your body. I'm not a very somatic person. I'm not somebody who like feels stuff at the level of the body. I've always felt like my emotions were in my head. So when people talk about like their emotions in their other places, I'm just like, I'm like I don't get it. But I would encourage them to think about that. And then I would encourage them to think about something they really like. It could be roller coasters, could be music, could be get specific and to get in touch with that feeling. And that feeling is your guide. Yeah. That feeling is your compass. Because the nervous system, it's not mystical. The mer- nervous system will orient toward the things that it's best equipped to do. It really will. And I really, animals do this naturally. My bulldog Costello never tries to be a different kind of dog, he never fetched once. First time I threw the ball, he walked to the ball, he sat down with the ball, he destroyed the ball. Because that's what bulldogs do. <laughs> you know, throw it to a retriever, yeah, they yeah. bring it back. Because yeah. the brain of the retriever is wired to feel good by retrieving. Yeah. And the brain of the bulldog is good to feel good by being horizontal with, and pulling on things with their, they like to tug. So I think humans, we're, so, we're similar enough, but we're different in the sense that you have something installed in you that feels right. And getting in touch with that feeling is key. And, you're not, and I should tell that there's n- you're not gonna get it right away. This is a practice you learn, like shooting basketballs or, or math. You do it over and over so that, but if you get started young at eight or nine, oh my goodness, great. And if you do it when you're 12, or even if you're 60 and you do this, you'll find that pretty soon you start steering in these directions. And I, I do believe it's a nervous, I think our, it's a neural, there's a real physical substrate for this. I, it's not mysticism. And whether or not that competition is with, you know, um, mental material like books and studying or whether or not it's physical competition, we need external influences. Like I think we, these days we're so attracted to the idea that we can, you know, control everything from the inside, but you need human interaction. Uh, it's absolutely necessary. And I think that, um, you know, it sort of harkens back to the story at the beginning. It's like all the the stress and that I was going through in those years, I mean, it absolutely made me better, right? Absolutely made me better. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I don't wish hardship on people, but humans are remarkable in their ability to step 
into challenge and to meet challenge. You know, I think that there's this important and very, very serious conversation now about mental health, right? The number of people suffering is just tremendous. But I think that we also are forgetting that, you know, that suffering process is, is it, it's a jumping off point, right? And I've had a number of friends commit suicide. I, I understand just how, you know, that's, that's a horrible tragedy and depression is absolutely terrible. But there's also this question of, you know, sort of like, what is our expectation about our mood, right? Like we're so, what, what are we really, what are we really trying to achieve with our moods? And so I always say, you know, there are five things that embody our whole existence. It's like our sensations, what we feel, our emotions, our perceptions, our thoughts, and our actions. That's pretty much it. And of all of those, the emotions are the most mysterious. It's like, it's kind of a combination of perception and thoughts. You know, you can control your behavior. You can control your thoughts. People often forget this, but your thoughts are your choice, right? I'm not saying you can suppress thoughts. I think there's been a lot of attention on trying to learn how to suppress thinking. I've never been able to suppress thinking ever. But what I can do is introduce new thoughts. Actually, Stephen Pressfield, who wrote The War of Art, mm -hmm. brilliant author and ex-military guy, he... He really, I think he said something like, you know, he was like in his mid forties before he had his first real thought. And what I like to think he was referring to was the first time that he realized that you could actually introduce a thought, that, it, that thoughts aren't just all spontaneous, so they can be deliberate. You know, your sensations you can control by your environment and your perceptions are largely about kind of like what sense you, you know, your thoughts about what you sense, right? But your feelings, I think we overvalue feelings. And here I'm going to come across as, you know, kind of a hardened male and about this. I, you know, I would place myself actually kind of on the wide emotionality scale. But I've learned over the years that emotions are just kind of a mishmash of perception and thought. I think we over, we overvalue their utility. And this is just my opinion. I don't have any scientific data to support it. But I also don't even know how you study emotions in the lab. Every time I see a laboratory that claims they study emotions, they're studying behavior. Mm. Every time there's, it's, I, you know, people are talking about fear and about courage, they're talking about a behavior that's measured. We don't know what these animals feel. We don't have the foggiest. I don't know what you feel right now. I barely understand what I feel right now. So I think that as a species, we've been, and in terms of mental, uh, mental health, we've been over-focused on feelings. And I think we need to think more carefully about physiology. Both those things. Breathing and vision also run in reverse, meaning if we change our pattern of breathing, we change our inner state. If our state changes, our breathing changes. So it's reciprocal. It's bidirectional. Likewise, with vision, when we are excited or stressed, the aperture of our visual window shrinks. We get that soda straw view of the world. When we are relaxed, the aperture of our vision expands. But as well, it runs in both directions. If we expand our view of the world, literally force our our visual field, or just, a, it's very easy, actually, you can do it no matter where you are right now. If you just try and expand your visual field, not by looking around or moving your head or eyes, but by trying to see yourself in the environment that you're in. So you literally dilate your view so you could see the ceiling and the floor and the walls if you're inside, or if you're outdoors, seeing as big an aperture of your visual field or your, your visual environment as possible. So you're directing your attention to, even though you might remain looking straight ahead, you're just directing your attention to as wide a peripheral view horizontally and vertically as possible. Is that what you mean? That's right. Exactly. So essentially, if you keep your head and eyes mostly stationary, you don't have to be you know, rigid about rock steady. But if you look forward and you expand your field of view, so you kind of relax your eyes so that you can see as much of your environment around you as possible to the point where you can see yourself in that environment, what you do is you are turning off the attentional and, believe it or not, the stress mechanisms that drive your internal state towards stress. This is why when you go to a, a vista or you view a horizon, it's very relaxing because you naturally go into panoramic vision. When you are indoors, you're looking at your phone, you're looking at a computer or a camera or something of that sort, or you're talking to somebody or an intense conversation, you don't, may not notice it, but your entire visual field shrinks to a much smaller aperture. And that drives an increase in alertness in internal state. And we sometimes call that stress if it's a negative experience. If it's a positive experience, we might call that love or obsession or fascination. But the important thing to realize is that both vision and breathing have a profound and very rapid effect on our internal state of mind and body. And it runs in both directions. Our internal state 
that could be triggered by a text message or hearing something that somebody says drives changes in our breathing and our vision. But our breathing and our vision can also drive changes in our internal state. And so that article in Scientific American was a discussion about how we can leverage the visual system and the respiration, the breathing system, in order to take control over our internal state. Because it's not just that 2020 was stressful. It's that our internal state determines everything. It doesn't just determine if we feel like we're having a hard time falling asleep or we're having a hard time focusing, for instance. It also determines how we batch time, how we analyze where we are in the world in terms of our lifespan. A good example of this would be when we are very stressed, we fine slice time. This is why when people are in a car accident or something, they might report that things were in slow motion. They're actually, your frame rate increases. Whereas when you're very relaxed, your frame rate slows down. And when we are relaxed, we get so-called perspective. We are able to say, well, this too shall pass, or I can place this stressful event in a context. So one thing that's just fundamental to how our nervous system works is that we are constantly placing our experience, both our immediate and past experience, as well as our anticipation of the future, into some sort of larger context. And our visual system, literally how we are viewing the world at that moment, dictates how we create perspective in terms of states of mind. Sounds a little bit abstract, but it's actually, yeah. it boils right down to optics of the eye and very concrete things like how you move your eyes and how you view the world. Growth mindset, which is the academic discovery and laboratory discovery of my colleague Carol Dweck at Stanford, is the hallmark of growth mindset is, to, is really two things. One is I'm not where I want to be now, but I but I will, I'm capable of getting there eventually. The other is to attach a sense of reward to the effort process itself. In fact, don't in, reward the result, reward the effort. That's right. And if you look at true high performers, people that are consistently good at what they do, they don't peak and go through the postpartum depression and crash and come back and their life is a cycle of ups and downs, but really people who are on that upward trajectory <clears throat> consistently, those people attach dopamine to the effort process. And actually, Carol's, one of her original studies on the discovery of growth mindset was these kids that loved doing math problems that they knew they couldn't get right. So it's like the people love puzzles, but in this case, they knew they couldn't get it right, but they loved doing it. And it, incidentally, or not so incidentally, these kids are fantastic at math when there is a right answer because they <clears throat> they feel some sense of reward from the effort process. Yeah. Now, the cool thing about dopamine is that it's very subjectively controlled. We can all learn to secrete dopamine in our brain in response to things that are in a purely subjective way. Our interpretation. And our interpretation. And, but it has to be attached to reality. So, you know, one should never confuse... What is real? Right. So, no, so <laughs> if, you're eff, if you're thinking about the effort you're expending... So, let's say somebody right now is financially back on their heels. Mm -hmm. And they're setting up a new business, for instance. And it's hard. If they can take a few moments or, or minutes each day to reflect on the fact that the effort process is allowing them to climb out of their hole, potentially, that it's giving them an opportunity, that it's somehow they are on the right path, or, or if they're not in movement along that path, or at least oriented on the right path, they're not lying in bed all day. They're taking a heels. step They're forward. taking a step. If they can reward that process internally, two things happen. First of all, the brain circuits that are associated with building subjective rewards and dopamine get stronger, so you get better at that process. And second, and most importantly, dopamine has an amazing ability to buffer adrenaline and buffer epinephrine. And what I mean by that is, there was a study that was published in the journal Cell, excellent journal, Cell Press Journal, a couple years ago, showing that with repeated bouts of effort, we use and we release more and more epinephrine. It's kind of adrenaline, but in the brain. With more effort, we're every time, this. every time you put in effort. So every time you make for this, let's keep it. If I were to keep it in the business context, every time you make to write that email, every time you let's see, it's a, a person who's a craftsman or a craftswoman. Every time you're working in the in the shop and doing that, every bit of effort, you're taking a little bit of money out of this epinephrine account. You're spending epinephrine. Now, at some point, those levels of epinephrine get high enough that you, you feel like quitting. It feels exhausting. <laughs> and this was done in a beautiful study, actually, where um, they control the visual environments and they have the subjects ex exert effort. 
and they can control the visual environment. So sometimes the effort of, of taking steps and moving forward, this is actually kind of pushing forward and kind of swimming motion, um, would give them the sensation that they were actually making progress. And other times it was an exercise in futility where they would just keep the, the visual world stationary and they would expend effort and they didn't think they were going anywhere. My gosh. Epinephrine's climbing, 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 and eventually they quit. Now dopamine is able to push back on that epinephrine and give you anyone the, the feeling that you could continue and maybe even the feeling that you want to continue. And you've seen this actually, like football is a good example. Two teams play, say the Super Bowl, both teams are max effort the entire time. Yeah. Max effort. The team that wins suddenly in a moment has the energy to jump all over the place party for days, <laughs> they can talk, I mean, they, they, they have They're exhausted energy. right before right. then. Well, that wasn't glycogen or stored energy of any kind, except it was neural energy. And what happened was, effort is this adrenaline, 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 eventually people quit, they just quit. The dopamine is able to suppress that, and so then you're expending effort, but you're doing it from a place of feeling like you have energy for it. I'm never going to argue that we can subjectively control all of our experience because there's some things that just genuinely suck, right? And when they and it's important to and it's important to register those those not so great events or terrible events because they can drive us also. You know, we can be driven from a place of anger, frustration, and and you know revenge, or we can be driven from a place of you know love, gratitude, and et cetera. I, I'm not here to judge which one is better or worse, but the nervous system doesn't distinguish between them. So if you're the kind of person that needs to, you know, kind of budge yourself into something, great. If you're the kind of person that wants to do things from more of a warm, fuzzy feeling, that's fine too. What I will say is this, the ability to tap into this dopamine reward system, which is activated anytime you're in pursuit of something that's outside the boundaries of your skin and literally the boundaries of your body, as well as the reward system, the serotonin oxytocin system, which is really about the things that are contained within your own body and immediate experience, things like gratitude and you know, touch and comfort and things like that with loved ones. The ability to tap into both is crucial. Now you said something really important, which was, well, negative thoughts, negative thoughts, what to do. I don't believe that it's very easy to suppress negative thoughts. However, when you realize that thoughts can be deliberately introduced, you can start replacing negative thoughts with new types of thoughts. So you can always add something in. But when people start to realize that thoughts are very much like physical actions of reaching and picking up a glass of water or taking a jog around the block yes. or typing an email perfectly, this is something I sometimes do because I'm I, you know, I struggle to do the perfect email. Not all my emails are perfect, but when I do one, I make sure that I, I complete it and I think, okay, it's possible. It's not because the email being perfect is so important. It's because I want to remind myself that my thoughts and my actions are essentially the same. The nervous system can organize thoughts. So for somebody that's struggling, you know, we have these examples like, oh, they were really back on their heels or they were so depleted, no money and all this stuff. What are they going to, we, we have so many examples like that, but in trying to make it actionable, it's really about saying, yep, that's all true, but I'm going to introduce a thought, which is I made it through today. I I made it through today and that's actually worth celebrating at a micro level. So if you can give yourself dopamine rewards in small increments, right? You're not trying to celebrate that you made it through one day. Sometimes that's a huge feat, but most of the time you just want to dose yourself with a little bit of that internal release of dopamine. You start rewarding incremental steps. And if there's anything that your listeners could take away from this whole thing about dopamine and reward schedules and being in movement, it's reward incremental steps, in particular incremental steps that are about forward action. So maybe that's writing an email. Maybe that's, um, Maybe that's that run around the block. Maybe that's something much grander for you. As you get better at things, right, the stairs get further and further away from one another because you've achieved more success. And so they tend to be, you have to take the rungs on the ladder further apart, so to speak. That's a time when you really need to implement not only the dopamine rewards, but also those serotonin and oxytocin rewards, et cetera. So to make it actionable, I would say, remember, don't spend so much time trying to suppress negative thoughts. If you need trauma therapy, pursue that with a professional. But if you have negative thoughts, just remember, I can also introduce positive thoughts the same way I can control running around the block. Positive thoughts are the equivalent of forward physical action. And if you reward them internally, you buffer yourself against the quitting 
circuit, this norepinephrine circuit we were talking about before, you are building a stronger version of yourself completely between your own ears. And some people say, well, that's silly. It's like you're saying, oh, I'm going to jump up and down, reward myself for doing nothing. No, you're building the neural circuits that reward, that you can control self-reward. And in doing that, you can push through days and weeks of effort consistently. I don't mean necessarily all nighters, but you can push and push and push. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Joe Dispenza, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. The victim is saying, I'm feeling this way because that person or that circumstance or I don't have any money is causing me to feel this way. That's my relationship with money. What that really means is I'm using my lack to reaffirm 